don't know me, I'm Bob Brokaw. The reason I feel qualified to get up here and, and talk about this is that I've screwed up more finishes than about any five or six people put together. What I've done is I have boiled down a set of uh, finishes that works for me. And I'm going to try to pass along those experiences to you. Okay, many of you have probably set out to try to do a project kind of like this. You know, built this beautiful heirloom jewelry box. And then once you get it done, you go, oh my gosh, now, now I probably ought to put a finish on it. And I, I stand a pretty good chance to wreck this thing. In this case, this one, this one had, a, had a lining in it. And the reason I start out with this as an example is this one is one that I came across. This uh, lady that I was introduced to, her husband had uh, passed away not, not too long before. It was made out of cherry, and the coloring on the thing was, was so good. I, I hated to imagine putting any additional color on it. So I just wound up doing a uh, pretty much a clear finish on it. So when you uh, when you get a hold of a project like this, you're you're uh, dangerously close to stepping outside your comfort. You're uh, if you're used to just taking taking some rattle can lacquer and starting into it. And hopefully by the time we get done with this, I'll be able to uh, move you out of your comfort zone and across that line in the sand and you feel more comfortable with it couple of these techniques that I'm going to describe to you. Okay, first off, let's let's talk about what constitutes a finish. It's a clear coating is all it is. You put it on wood to try to protect it from moisture and other elements, fingerprints, kids, you know, a few things like that. It's intended to make the wood look richer and deeper and possibly even richer than what the real wood really is. The various products that you put on there is a, a lot of times a stain that contains a wood finish and some type of colorant and lots of thinner because what uh, what aids in the curing process on this stuff is the the thinner evaporates out gases and leaves the finish behind in the case of stains the thinner is added to make, to make it easy to remove the excess stain okay the the more extended definition of this the finish is an entire buildup of multiple coatings most of these projects that i'm going to show you in here are more than one coating, and I've got these uh, storyboards here that will uh, that I'll, I'll talk to as we go on, and I will uh, explain to you the the various layers, how I applied them, and what they do for you. Then, in the several different layers of uh, protectant that's on there, some of what uh, what I prefer to do is trap the color in the middle of the other layers, and you'll see why in a minute. So to, to stress again, the finish is the clear coating and all of its related steps. So technically, if, you know, if you're talking about a finish, it's, it's more than one layer. Okay, in terms of types of wood finishes, most of you have tried uh, some combination of these. There's oil finishes, like boiled linseed oil. That was what was applied to this bench when it was built. Uh, there's stuff like tongue oil, which is that product there. It leaves a really nice color to the wood uh, when it's applied bare. It takes a long time to cure. You know, you're probably talking three to four days for the uh, you know, excess fluids to evaporate. And then to protect it, you still need a top coat on there of some type because it will wear out after about a year. You, know, you won't be able to tell anything happened. Okay, then there's oil-based varnish. Among those is uh, the alkalid finishes, polyurethane, spar varnish. I really don't care for the polyurethane and spar varnish except for a, a top coat. Primarily because the, in the case of the polyurethane, the method of binding from one layer to another is going to become particularly important before this, this class is over. There's a, uh, some, you know, some type of a bond has to exist between the two layers. Then there's water-based finishes, they're, they're fairly new to the scene. Uh, I haven't made the transition over to those yet, uh, partially because of the, the bonding issue and significant differences in speed with which you can apply finish. Shellac is one of the, one of the older finishes. It's 
really ancient, derived from resin secretions of a light bug. Those might be able to get a shot of that. The way I prefer to do shellac, oh, most of you head for your local Ace Hardware and go get some deft. There's other stuff in the deft that uh, makes it last longer, uh, makes it propellant out of a spray can. And I find that those give me more trouble than any benefit that I derive from it. So what I do is I take just regular shellac flakes, put about a quarter of this jar full of flakes, and then add denatured alcohol to it. And what that does is after, depending on how fresh the shellac flakes are, it'll maybe take oh, three or four hours to dissolve. Then you cut it to, you know, you, you'll pour, decant some of it off and get it to a strength and a color that, uh, that is suitable for whatever project you're going to use it on. And we'll talk a lot more about that later. And you're going to see a lot of examples here of what I do with it. Some of the other products that are there is lacquer. That's the finish that's used on a lot of kitchen cabinetry, uh, vanities, uh, a lot of household furniture. There's a couple of different forms of that. There's some that is used in industry that is uh, catalyzed, such that when you, when you blend a part A and a part B together, you've got a limited number of hours to, to get that thing on. And you need to clean it up you know, pretty quickly after you, after you spray it. And it's a, lacquer is one of, the, one of the products that's a little more difficult for the, the woodworker to get his head wrapped around. You can't brush the stuff on. By the time you dip your, your brush in the can and you reach the end of a, about a two-foot stroke, it's dry. <laughs> There's no such thing as going back over it. You, you can go back over it, and that's one of the things that I like about lacquer, is that each successive coat bonds to the first coat with a chemical reaction. So it's what, uh, what real lacquer is going to do, nitrocellulose lacquer, is it's going to uh, melt the coat that is underneath it, and then the two of them bond together. And this behavior will continue until the stuff is about oh, two to three months old. Beyond that point, it's, it'll bind, but it's not as strong. Okay, let's talk about drying time on, on some of these things. In case of shellac or lacquer, uh, those finish the fastest. That's part of why I like to use them. You know, I'm an instant results kind of guy. You know, I want to see the, see the results in a hurry. Uh, stuff like uh, sanding sealer, for example. Uh, you put that, uh, you put a nitrocellulose sanding sealer on, and in a matter of you know, two hours, it's ready to sand out and do more stuff with it. Water-based finishes are probably next in terms of speed, but again, I haven't made the made the switch over to that yet because I haven't found any compelling reason to drive me over there. Varnish and oils, uh, that it's usually a overnight overnight dry time and usually in an elevated temperature situation so with the temperatures in the mornings uh, what they've been around here it's not particularly easy to use the you know the varnishes and oils because they don't it's not conducive to them curing. One of the things that I found over you know, the past 20 or so years is that uh, moving air of any kind after you've applied the finish that just really speeds up drying. You know, left the thing in the shop and I turn on a you know, fan like one of the ones sitting behind the camera over here. And just that little bit of air moving around the shop did a miraculous job on, on curing this stuff. Okay, in terms of safety, as we move down the list there, the boiled linseed oil and tongue oil are the least toxic to mess with. You know, in terms of odor and aroma coming off of the things, it's, it's usually quite light. Water-based finishes, you know, they have some alcohol and stuff like that in it, a little bit of solvent, so that stuff's fairly safe. That's why California has embraced water-based finishes. They have pretty much banned nitrocellulose. Next in order is shellac. It's got uh, denatured alcohol. You know, it's not too, too tax toxic, and usually the odor is not, not too, too bad. Well, one of the things that I have noticed when I'm spraying a fairly large project or something like that, the, the mist coming off of that, it's, it's actually dried shellac that is still floating around in the air. 
but it will create quite a cloud. That's part of why the fan uh, comes in. I usually keep one end of the shop completely open and, and a fan blowing across there. So that keeps the, uh, keeps the air cleaned out in there. If I'm having to shoot uh, shellac in some place like Rob's shop, there is <laughs> it, it's pretty easy to fill the air with a cloud. Then you've got oil-based varnishes. They thin with mineral spirits. I saw this comment in there that some people find the mineral spirits objectionable but not toxic. There's two kinds of mineral spirits that I found. There's the odorless and standard mineral spirits. I found a significant difference in the performance of the two. In terms of finishing, the, uh, the mineral spirits that still contains the, the odor seems to cure a lot faster and seems to do a significant improvement on being able to get the finish to flow out. If you're adding uh, mineral spirits to either stain, to, to lighten it up, or particularly if you're adding it to um, polyurethane to, to help it flow out without any bubbles or ripples or anything like that, I find that the, uh, the conventional mineral spirits to be much more effective. Okay, then you've got the ultimate toxic finishes, the, the lacquer and the high performance version of the lacquers. You've got a couple of different solvents that, that are used to thin those and those are known to be pretty toxic. Most people will don a, you know, a mask to keep from sucking in the vapors and this is not the typical you know, 3M type of paper mask that you you find out at your Home Depot, because about the only thing those things are good for is keeping out birds and politicians. So uh, you need you need something that's got some carbon filters in it to be able to keep the uh, nitrocellulose vapors out of there. I have enough breathing problems on my own just by adding a mask that <laughs> that uh, that kind of triggers a you know some sort of sensation in my head that I can't breathe. So usually I I will use uh, airflow to. Get the uh, get the vapors away from me, rather than using a mask. Yes, sir. Your slide is on solvent safety. You know, besides you know what we're breathing, which is mainly what you're talking about on there, the boiled linseed oil is self-combustible. You know, although yep. it's not toxic, but if you leave rags laying in that thing, you've got it sitting on the counter or something like that, and it's not even a hot condition, somewhat warm condition, it can catch fire by itself. And uh, the other stuff is, if you have like an electric heater in a room, you don't want to do that around somebody. So you have to be careful what you have. But I had a friend that left some rags. He does um, minor scroll solving dip and stuff and used toenail. He left it on the kitchen table and went to bed. And this thing self-combusted in the middle of the night and caught his kitchen on fire. You know, so there is such a thing as self-combustion. All it has to do is have a little bit of warmth in there from the heater going, along with rags sitting there that are saturated. So when you get done with it with uh, that and your rags, you're better off putting them in like a metal can outside. And I usually, when I use the stuff, I actually run water over the rags and dilute it before I throw it away. Yeah, that uh, discussion Rob just did, I, I saw that in one of the books that I was referring to. I was going to copy it, but forgot it. But the, uh, he's, he's absolutely right on that that boiled linseed oil, especially if you mix that with other products, particularly like the mineral spirits, uh, that'll accelerate a, a uh, chemical reaction. And there's been lots and lots of shops that have had fires in them by taking the, the oil-soaked rags and put those in a, in a garbage can, particularly where, where they're compressed somewhat which will accelerate the heat. Generally in my own shop, what I do is as soon as I'm done with one of those things before, I, you know, I usually clean up at the end of the day, I will take those things and shake them out and carry them outside. I've got a brick planter on the outside mm -hmm. and I usually spread those out over that, over that brick planter so that they will air out. And if they catch fire out there, all it's gonna do is darken the brick until, until you get out there and pressure wash the, <laughs> pressure wash the planter again. Any questions before I continue there? Okay, then uh, one of the things that's important in your finish is you need to sand, sand, and sand. You need to get that thing down to where it's, it's pretty smooth before you go applying a finish. There was quite a discussion in some of the reference material that I used here. Bob Flexner is one of the ones that is highly <coughs> referenced authors on uh, finishing. He says it's faster to do your sanding and so forth. You feel more productive if you use something like a random orbital sander. He said, but you're going to wind up leaving machine marks 
behind if you do that. He says he will he will use a you know a power sander of some type to get the initial finish down, but his whatever his last uh, grid of sandpaper is that he's using, uh, handheld approach. My preference is to use a cork block. And then you take sandpaper and sh and quarter sheet it, wrap it around there, and then proceed to go with the grain for that last pass. It doesn't take but a minute to do a, you know, a project like this, and then, then what you're doing is you're removing those last vestiges of uh, machine marks or possibly uh, grit from a prior coat of sanding. What grit do you want? I normally stop at 220. There are occasions where you that I'll get into later that you may want to go to 320. Okay, the source of the wood is pretty much a dictate to me to determine what grit you start with and where you finish. Again, I reiterate here the objective is to remove the tooling marks and scratches that are left behind. If you've attended one of the sawmill days over at Ricky's, stuff that comes off of that sawmill there, it's got to be run through a planer first to get it down, and then even, even then, there may be some tool marks left behind, uh, depending on the species of wood that you're working with, that you may want to be pretty aggressive on taking those tooling marks off of there. You may want to start with something as, as aggressive as like a 60 grit. That should get rid of the heavy tool marks in a hurry, and it's usually pretty quick steps beyond that to get rid of the, the finer and finer tool marks. With uh, finished all side uh, wood that you would typically get down at Swanee Lumber or Home Depot, you can usually start with 150 and rapidly go through 220. If you're applying a finish or stain or dye or something like that, usually your finish will take care of anything 220 and up. You'll, you'll maybe want to use some 320 or 400 to finish the finish that we'll get to later. Do you use a sealer before you? Getting to that. You use a sealer and then, then sand it with the 220, is that what you do? Yeah, that'll be next. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. In your example, if you start with 150, how many step, how many grits are between 150 and 220? One, 180. <laughs> okay, once you get done with that, uh, with that sanding, what you're going to wind up with, if you looked at the wood under a microscope, now that's enhanced with some color there to show the, the uh, height differences, but what's actually going to wind up happening is there's going to be a fuzz sticking up off the top of that wood. It's going to look much like the hair on your arm. If you, uh, if you rub your arm, it feels smooth because what's happening is that fuzz is laying over as you, as you wipe your arm with it. And your first finish, your, your first coat of most anything, is going to make that stuff stand up. A lot of you have probably experienced this by putting uh, nitrocellulose sanding sealer on a piece of wood and you go, ooh, that's, <laughs> that's pretty, uh, pretty rough. But if you hit that with a few strokes of uh, 220, it'll knock that down and it'll be, it'll be smooth. And you're thinking, ooh, this, this is going to turn out good. Okay, there's uh, another problem that's going to arise. If you take a look at that, that finish that's up there, that is a byproduct of somebody taking a piece of wood. They've tried to remove all the, all the, uh, all the marks and so forth, the tooling marks. Then they just took a can of stain, you know, much like this golden oak or red oak or one of those, one of those popular colors, and just rub that, rub that out on there, wipe off the excess, and you go, ooh, that's ugly. What did I do? Okay, what has happened there is the factory machining that that piece of wood underwent. Your big box lumber stores are famous for this. They get, uh, they get lumber from mills that their, their objective is to take a, take a piece of wood and do as few operations as possible to that piece of wood to get it out to the yard. So what they will do is they've got some really aggressive machinery. They're trying to put a whole lot of linear feet through that machine. Oftentimes a lot of uh, shortcuts that they'll take, like they don't always stop and sharpen the blade when they should. So that's why you'll see those, those vertical stripes in there. That's because the blade is not terribly sharp. So they compensate for that by turning up the pressure. And each time that blade sweeps around and hits that wood, it compresses the wood really hard and then it springs back up again so that it's level. And you don't see that when you're sanding it. When the wood's bare, you don't see it. You, you hit a stain on that and all of a sudden it jumps out at you. The way you solve both of these problems, like the, the one that I described to you earlier with the, the fuzz that's standing up on the wood and this, this other piece that has been abused at the sawmill, you apply a sealant to it. So before proceeding to the next step of putting a, uh, what I do to uh, solve that is I use something like a pre-stain conditioner. Minwax makes a pretty good commercial version. In my shop, what I like to use instead, or maybe there's an alternate, 
is all you use shellac. That'll prevent blotching, which is another thing that you need to be cautious of. Uh, cherries are real favorite in a lot of shops, and cherry is also the one that is most susceptible to blotching. This will uh, leave white patches all over the wood, kind of a circular version of that big white, white stripe that you see there. Uh, the other question that you want to do is before you start applying much of anything there, in my shop what I, what I always do is before I apply the, the next commodity to a piece of wood, I turn around and ask myself, if this thing doesn't work, how am I going to reverse it? You stand a pretty good chance, you know, if you start out with one of these uh, Minwax finishes here, uh, most of the Minwax products, particularly the red oak, and the, the darker you go, uh, the more prevalent it is. Because these are what are referred to as pigmented stains. There's some large particulates in there, a lot of them, that they use to achieve the color. And this stuff embeds into the, into the grain. And if you apply that on bare wood, it's not coming off. You gotta plane it, you gotta sand it, or you gotta bleach it to get it off. But if you apply a sealer coat down first, something that's gonna be just really light, it'll soak into the wood, and it'll stop, it'll arrest some of that penetration. The stain will lay on the top, it'll still color it up, maybe not as intently as what it would on bare wood, but it's probably more attractive, especially like in the case of red oak. Red oak, for those who, who aren't familiar with the structure of that stuff, is roughly akin to looking at a full box of soda straws. You lift the lid on that thing and you got all these holes looking up at you. You take and cut that box of soda straws in half and turn it over and look at it sideways, you can imagine what you're looking at there. You got some really deep gouges in there and that uh, pigmented dye is what's going down in there. And any grain figure that's in oak is going to be just really subdued by these pigmented dyes. That's why I I almost always will thin or undercoat a, a pigmented dye before I use it because it's, it's, it usually obscures the grain just way too much for my liking. Yes, sir? Since oil finishes, either tongue oil or danish oil are kind of designed to soak into the wood, yes. would you ever use a sanding sealer prior to using an oil finish? Uh, I probably wouldn't. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It, it kind of defeats the purpose, yes, sir. You said top coating, uh, it's going back a little bit, but when yeah. you said top coating uh, tongue oil, how long do you let it dry and what do you top coat it with? In the case of tongue oil, I would probably let that stuff cure for four days, I'd say. More than likely, top coat it with, depending on the application, you know, what the piece is ultimately going to be used for. I recently did a large coffee table for a neighbor, and I knew there was going to be, you know, beverages on there coffees, alcoholic beverages, things like that. You know, any beverage containing any, any alcohol at all is potentially going to attack uh, shellac. So shellac is pretty much out of the equation. But a uh, polyurethane would be a good top coating for that type of thing. If it's going to be a display piece, I would probably use a nitrocellulose lacquer over the top of the thing. It'll, it'll still bind at that point. If there's any question about compatibility between whatever you've just put on such as the, uh, the tone oil and what you're ultimately going to finish it with. If you use shellac, especially the stuff that you make in your shop, that is the great neutralizer. So I have found that shellac will stick to just about anything and anything will stick to shellac. So I don't have to be concerned with mechanical or chemical compatibility between the two. It's usually quite, quite durable. Rob? Well, I was going to say, if you had something like a Oh, 120 pine canes that you want to put tongue oil on. When you got done, if I put that on and let it dry, I mean, I've used tongue oil on uh, bunch of birch and stuff, and I really like the way it immediately, you see the results, it looks great. Yep. And sometimes when I did that, I would do two coats. I put it on and let it dry overnight, and then I put another coat on and let it dry for a couple of days. Could you go straight to the regular, uh, lacquer or would you have to put shellac because I don't want to do on 120 canes four different levels to get the finish on five including the sanding sealer. Experience has told me that you can go straight to lacquer like a sanding sealer uh, on top of uh, something like tone oil yeah, and oil and stuff up. like that. Yeah. 
you, you, you need to let it cure. Yes, sir. Uh, can you tell me about the uh, Danish oil, between Danish oil and palm oil? What's the other, other difference? <laughs> the, uh, the Danish oil is colorant that is added to tongue oil. They're, they're pretty much the same. Treat, you treat it the same way. My experience is that the Danish oil dries a little faster than the tongue oil. It's, it's probably got solvents in there that accelerate that, yeah. There's some percentage of tongue oil in, in Danish oil. You know, maybe 20, 30 percent. The rest of it is uh, solvents and dyes, various colors. Any other questions? Uh, but at any rate, with that, with that dialogue there, with each, uh, each one of these coatings that you want to put on there, you don't stop and ask yourself, if this thing, if the wheels fall off of this thing, how am I going to get back to a, uh, a version of this thing that I can go ahead with? without having to run the thing back through the planer again. If you've got something like a finished jewelry box, you don't, don't want to do that. Uh, you'd wear yourself out with uh, sandpaper and all that type of stuff. I'll get into some other projects here shortly where I'll explain to you where I have had to exercise that. The first coat uh, is going to seal the wood. You know, this would be like the sanding sealer. Or if you want to do a, uh, a step ahead of that, use the, uh, the pre-stained conditioner maybe add some pigmented stain at that point, and then put on your sanding sealer. Any of those kind of things are going to raise the grain. You know, eventually with, when you get to the sanding sealer or some type of sealant on there, that's going to cause that fuzz to arrest. Then you sand that down. That sealant at that point then gets you back to a point that you can, you can consider it, it reversible at that point. Okay, my preferred first coats, I've already talked about the uh, the wood conditioner, talk about the shellac, stuff like these uh, nitrocellulose uh, sanding sealers. As you can see from that list of chemicals on there, on that uh, sanding sealer, there's some pretty wicked products in there that you don't want to be in a confined space with that stuff. <laughs> it gets just real, real hard to breathe. Okay, back to that ugly piece of plywood again, or ugly piece of uh, hardwood. The stain conditioner or shellac will prevent that effect that you see there. What that does, that, that seals up and equalizes that blush uh, that you're seeing in there, and it prevents that effect that you see. Once it's sealed and sanded smooth after the sealing, then you decide, okay, what, uh, what kind of color am I going to put on there, and how am I going to do it? Are you going to stick with your uh, pigmented stains? You know, a lot of people feel perfectly comfortable with that. Uh, I've gotten even adventuresome enough <coughs> in my works and so forth that I, uh, I will blend the stains in order to achieve the color that I want. Red oak usually gets, looks good on oak, uh, especially if you cut it with something. It, red oak by itself is usually a bit intense for my liking. I will use uh, Minwax Natural or I'll just cut it with straight <coughs> mineral spirits. Apply that and then wipe off the excess. That way it doesn't look as intense. Then over to the dyes, on the dye side over there, what I will do is use uh, shellac or, or straight alcohol, but most times what I prefer to do is use shellac. And I will add some dye to it. Let's talk about the dyes while we're there. What I like to use is the, the Transtent products. It is an aniline dye that will it'll mix with alcohol, water, shellac, lacquer, you name it seems to be compatible with most of those things. If you're doing a large project and you're using shellac as a carrier, usually what you have to do is, especially if I'm making it up in one of these spray container inserts that I use, oops, in my spray gun, what I use is a rig like this. I will add a certain amount of uh, shellac in there to make my recipe, my color recipe. I'll put shellac in there, and then in order to get to a starting point for color, you maybe have to add as many as 20 drops of dye to the thing. And you, what I prefer to do, you can get basic colors, the primary colors, red, green, blue, yellow, those types of things. Anyway, those are, the, those are the type of products that I like to use. I, I will use the pre-colored uh, transtent 
dyes because they, they come very, very close to uh, the color that I'm trying to achieve. What about this point is where you want to make a uh, recipe board, such as what you see ahead of you there. We'll, we'll pause in a minute and I'll start stepping you through some of those things. As you're experimenting with whatever color you want to do, you, you're, you have stopped at a point. You've put a, some type of sealer on there. You're going to apply, start to apply some color to it. Now is when you want to start making notes on what this color is, whether you like it or not. How many, how many different kinds of color did you blend to get to that point, and what are the proportions? What I start doing about that point is I start documenting the project. This is, these are notes that I made to myself and to the customer where I built a full-size king headboard out of some highly figured cherry. The panels in the middle of the headboard were Baltic birch plywood. I used that for strength, and then I uh, veneered it with a, a quilted cherry to, to go along with the rest of the stuff. And then there was a curved decoration on each end that was American walnut. I knew with the type of finish that I was gonna put on there, I had to put some instructions on there for the owner. You know, knowing full well, she's gonna go running right out and get you know, some, some type of grocery store wood finish that is oftentimes not conducive to whatever finish you put on there. Since I had planned on doing this thing, finishing it with uh, shellac, I didn't want her to use anything alcohol-based, so I gave her instructions to just use sudsy water and wipe it dry. You know, just regular uh, dishwashing liquid or something like that in some, in some water, sponge it, and that'll, that'll get all kinds of debris off and dirt and all that type of stuff then periodically use some automotive style wax, something that's got high, high carnauba content, Mother's, Johnson's Paste Wax, something like that. Yes, sir? My mother and grandmother used the Berkey oil and soap on all the furniture. Yep. Is that considered a uh, grocery okay. store not good for the furniture? Or? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a soap product. It's intended to get the dirt out of the furniture. Awful lot of the oils and waxes and all that kind of stuff at the grocery store, all that's going to do is bury the dirt deeper in the grain. Okay, then the next thing you want to do is document the process. Okay, what I did starting out, and this, this is a, one of the reasons I usually include this in a project that I do for customers and whatnot is I, whoever comes along after me that's going to attempt to effect a repair on this thing, I'm trying to give them a head start on what they're about to uncover if they go in there to try to effect a repair on there. Especially on cherry, I will start out with a one to two pound cut of shellac. That's uh, one to two pounds of shellac to a, a gallon of denatured alcohol. If you're going to make a smaller quantity than that, just back off of the proportions on that. Use a quarter of a pound of shellac and a quarter of, quarter of alcohol. Then, uh, then what I did is it, the color that I applied to the thing was uh, tinted and evened with the, uh, the reason I mentioned that is this wood had a lot of uh, sap wood in it. A lot of the cherry that you get has got these kind of white streaks in it. A lot of people consider that uh, a nice feature. You know, it's a natural, natural effect to cherry. As soon as the customer saw that, her upper lip curled up and she goes, "Ew! What can you do about that?" So I spent the next week with a uh, with an airbrush and some of that dark mission brown aniline dye and shellac, and I airbrushed out every one of those every one of those light streaks that was in that that cherry to try to make it even. I did a a color seal that was uh, two coats of shellac applied as French polish. Okay, French polish is a new term that we just introduced. If you don't want to use spray equipment, it is entirely possible to get a spray type effect. I've <coughs> shown this to some fairly accomplished woodworkers that were just absolutely astounded at the result. What you wind up using is uh, cheesecloth. You can get it down at hobby stores, you know, Michael's, uh, Hobby Lobby, ones like that, Joann's. You could get a whole bag of this for a couple of bucks. The, uh, then usually what I do is I soak this stuff, pre-soak this in alcohol, then wrap it over satin, a piece of satin fabric. You can get uh, the yard of that down at Joann's for you know, 10 or 15 bucks at the most. And then that'll, that'll last you about a lifetime. Then what you do is you wrap that over the, uh, the cheesecloth you take a, a tin like this, put some shellac in it, then you'll, you'll dip this down in there. The satin is then carrying the, uh, the shellac, and you wipe that on your board. And when you get done wiping it, it's just about as smooth as if you had sprayed it. But it is a very, very thin coat. And uh, 
what you've got to do is apply quite a few coats of that. I have some pe seen some people get just really meticulous about that stuff and they will hand rub on 20, 30, 40 coats of that on there. If they get quite a few of those coats on there, <coughs> that's when you want to hit it with some 400 grit sandpaper to smooth it off before you put another 10 coats on. Is yes, sir. You said wipe it on, then you said rub it on. Is it, do you apply pressure or is it just wipe? A uh, little bit of pressure, yeah. Gets it down into the grain and it also causes it to uh, bond with the prior coat. And you want to leave it, uh, let it cure for 30 minutes at least before you put the next coat on. There will be some telltale lines that will be left behind, but if you hit that with some uh, 400 grit sandpaper, those will be gone. Then some 4 out steel wool on top of that, and it'll be all very smooth texture after that. After it's uh, cured for a good bit, then you can put some wax on top of that, and you're done. If you need to recoat it beyond that point, your, uh, your alcohol is going to melt the wax, and it'll, it'll actually blend at that point. And then uh, what you've done is you, you've then allowed yourself a step back, you decided you didn't like some effect that you'd done, so you did some sanding, you put more, you put wax on there, for example. You said, hmm, I want to want to make that coating a little thicker, so you put more French polish on there and just build back up. So you've pretty much taken it down to the step prior to where you put the wax on. So you, you've used the alcohol to melt the wax. It's a reversible process. I did put two coats of flat lacquer and then uh, wet sanded that. By wet sanding, what I'm talking about there is I've got uh, flat lacquer on top of shellac at this point. They're compatible. They, they work quite well. Then for <coughs> wet sanding, what I'll do is I'll take uh, 400 grit again, and I will, I will dip that in mineral spirits. So mineral spirits is my lubricant that I'm using to sand the finish out. And then once I wipe off the uh, mineral spirits, get that clear, then I use the Johnson's Paste Wax that gets the, the rest of the residue from the sanding process off. Okay, let's talk about some real life examples here. Plywood is uh, mm -hmm. particularly troublesome to work with, especially with stains and whatnot, because you have it on this top sheet of the veneer on plywood, you haven't got a whole lot to work with. So um, it's a pretty, pretty important to be able to get it to a point where you can reverse it if something goes wrong. But I've discovered over the, over the years that if I take, a, take this pre-stained conditioner that I talked about on here, if I put that on there first, that's going to that's going to take away any uh, anything like blotching or machining marks and and that type of stuff and going to give me a better chance when I go to put on a, a color finish and in this particular case this is uh, it's a red oak stain and what I did is I reduced that by using red oak stain along with natural what I wanted was the chemicals that were in the natural finish uh, in order to thin it without using mineral spirits and losing too much of the, the binding qualities that were in there. So that is a, it's a good color finish. And then to do a, a top coat on there to protect the color, I use shellac on top of that. That is roughly equivalent to doing the sanding sealer. And then the lowermost panel of that is this above finish. As I pass this around, you're gonna feel that, that's kind of rough. And then the, the lower finish down there is the above finish uh, sanded out. Okay, this is a variation off of that. Again, I used the same pre-stain conditioner. I used the same red oak stain on top of that. And then once I applied that and let that cure for half hour to an hour to let it soak in, out gas, all that type of stuff, then I put on the uh, nitrocellulose sanding sealer. The cabinet guys back there in the back, they're, they're probably very familiar with that, that type of a process. As I pass this around, you're gonna feel that that's, that's probably gonna be even rougher. And then, then what you do is you sand that out and it's ready at that point to put your, your top coat on, which is probably gonna be more nitrocellulose lacquer. Okay, now then on this piece here, you're gonna find uh, notes on the back as to what is in what stage. I'm trying to, again, I did, I did sanding sealer in this region here, stain conditioner in this region here. Then I decided on this fine specimen of white oak that a nice uh, golden color might be a good addition to the natural color of the, the white oak. So I did a golden oak stain and a nitrocellulose sealer on top of that, or just regular sanding sealer, like you all can find down at Walmart or any of the big box places. Then I, uh, then I sanded that out, put a flat lacquer on this portion here. I thought that turned out quite nice. Okay, another piece of oak here. It was bigger so that I could put the labels on the front here so I don't need to wave it around and risk uh, 
getting buzz irritated here. Okay, uh, this example here is the recipe that I used for my own floor. You know, it started out being red oak. I put, I put the recipe right on the front, a one quarter to one full measure of red oak to golden oak stain. So I did four parts of red oak is what, what I intended to get across there. Didn't, didn't come across all that well. It's four parts of red oak and one part of golden oak stain over a stain conditioner and then a nitrocellulose sealer on top of that. Sanded that out, then put a regular uh, lacquer top coat on there. Now, on the lacquer top coat, typically what I'll do is I'll put some type of thinner in there to get it to flow out nicely. Those of you that work with much with lacquer, when you first put that stuff on, you'll look at it and you're hoping that orange peel effect that you're seeing right after you put it down is going to go away. <laughs> and you're kind of staring at that thing a little bit because it doesn't take but minutes for this, this stuff to decide whether it's going to flatten out or not. There's a number of ways that you can help yourself on that. Add a little bit of lacquer, thinner, or retarder. Uh, the higher the temperature gets, the more you're going to want to use a retarder. You know, because the, uh, the temperature is going to cause that, uh, that lacquer thinner to flash off quickly in worse conditions. When you're applying that stuff in the shop and so forth, you can, you can start spraying that thing at the board and you'll notice it's starting to bounce off. And what that is, is the stuff is actually dried in the air on the way to your board. So you know in that case you need to, you need to add some retarder to it to keep it, keep it liquid longer and also get closer to the wood. Uh, that's why the spray gun that I use, I've been through quite a, quite a number of them. This is a DeVilbus SRI Pro, and uh, the adjustment controls on here, they look pretty simple. You know, product flow here, and fan control here. And I mean to tell you, you've got enough latitude on the adjustments on this thing that you can go all the way from writing your name in cursive you know, roughly akin to a fountain pen, clear on out to where this thing has got a, got a fan probably five inches wide at four inches off the piece of wood. So it's a quite a versatile product. I got put onto that by a guy that I have picked his brain about spray equipment to give him a little bit of credit on this. Uh, name is Steve Bay. He operates uh, Steve's Tool Repair over Marietta. And that guy is like trying to take a sip of water out of a fire hydrant when you're talking to him about <laughs> spraying, spray equipment, uh, finishing, all that type of stuff. He's, he is a wealth of knowledge. Okay, let's uh, pass that sample around. Okay, that pretty much covers the oak type of products. We'll get into some different type of products here. I believe this to be uh, mahogany. Get this position down here for Buzz's benefit. Mahogany's got a pretty subtle grain to it. It is easy to cover that up, especially with something like a pigmented dye. So what I uh, what I chose to do with this is I went at this with shellac as a basis. I put on a seal coat first, sanded that out, then I proceeded to do start doing a color buildup. On this. Now one of the things on working with dye and shellac, you don't want to go for the color in one pass. The, uh, the dye will start separating on you. So you'll wind up with a big pool of shellac on there and about three dots of color. So what you want to do is you want to apply this thinly, put that on in, in thin coats, let it set up for maybe two or three hours, go back and do another coat until you get it the, um, the intensity that you want, the darkness. Uh, you can't be in a rush with this type of thing. I will show you an example here in a moment of the uh, rush that I was trying to do to get in one more sample <laughs> at the end of the day. So this uh, this, I've got the legend on the back there so that you can follow along. Okay, maple is another one that's got a fairly subtle grain to it. 
and it also practically refuses to take pigmented stain because even bare uh, bare maple doesn't have any exposed uh, uh, scores in it to be able to take the the uh, pigment so what I prefer to do with maple to get to help the color out on that is again I'll use the the shellac add some add some dye to it in this case it was a, a golden brown let's pass that one around I guess it's another one of the same okay now then now then we'll cover what uh, what I was talking about there where what, what is your recovery plan for where it doesn't go right here's a couple examples that I was trying to get in uh, one of these is uh, yeah this one is uh, poplar most of you have seen poplar and you're going how can I color that to make it look like anything as you can see with uh, what I started out with over here you know that was looking pretty good that was just the initial few coats I sealed it put color on top top coated that again with all all with uh, Schleck products then uh, then I realized I had not sanded it at all, you know, because I hadn't had an opportunity to yet. So the fuzz is still present. So I sanded that. And I started, you know, started doing that before this thing had completely cured out. I probably should have added another couple of top coats on there before I sanded it out. Got a little aggressive with sanding, and I did some sand throws. Uh, well, okay, maybe that'll cover up. I did the same thing to both. Maybe that'll cover up with some top coat. I put the top coat on there, all that did is make it worse. <laughs> but I know because of the fact that I haven't actually penetrated the grain of the wood, I can take alcohol to this, wipe all this finish off. Maybe hit it with a light 220 grit and start over. So I haven't, I haven't wiped out my path backwards. So that's kind of what you do when, you, when the wheels fall off. <laughs> okay, this was a nice piece of... Uh, maple that I started with. Again, I put a couple of top coats of shellac on there, started trying to accelerate color application, and it started to separate a little bit. So I sanded that out, did the same thing to both sides, then I tried to apply the top coat of that got in a bit of a hurry, and it started trying to run and bleed and do all kinds of bad things. But again, I feel confident that uh, I could rescue this thing with wiping the whole thing off with alcohol and start it back up again. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.